All right, question for you. Uh, have you ever felt stuck in a rut? Raise your hand if you've ever felt stuck in a rut. Totally. Have you ever felt like you needed uh, to change directions in life and do something different, something new? Yeah? Uh, I think we've all felt that way before. It's a pretty common human feeling. Uh, some people call it wanderlust or uh, restlessness, uh, being unsettled. Uh, I heard this week it's called having itchy feet. You just want to keep moving, keep doing something. That's not athlete's foot. It's itchy, different thing. Um, and people, they respond to this very common feeling in different ways, sometimes good and sometimes not so good. One of the, the more common ruts that people fall into is what's called the midlife crisis. Okay, this is not the time to look at your spouse, married couples, all right? Um, it's that moment, that was a joke, we can laugh, all right? Uh, it's that, that moment when you realize that you're about to enter the season of life um, when your days ahead of you are far fewer than the days behind you. And, and we all know the stereotypical responses uh, that people have to midlife crises, right? Uh, men who buy fancy cars and end their marriages or women who take drastic steps to change their appearance to, to regain a sense of youth. Uh, not the most healthy responses to a midlife crisis, I think we'd all agree. Um, or maybe you're not there yet. We've got a pretty young church family. Um, maybe you're not in a midlife crisis, but you've been doing the same things for years, and it doesn't feel like you're achieving your goals or getting any closer to fulfilling your dreams. Uh, I felt this way. After I, I graduated high school and started my first year of college, I was kind of bored with my life, and I couldn't really see myself doing the same things for another four years. And so I joined the military and did something completely different than I had done before uh, for a really long time. Maybe I should have just gotten a kitty cat or a puppy or something instead of making such a big life change decision. Um, but I think, uh, going a little bit of a different direction but similar, there are also many people in our country right now who feel like it's time for change and that something new and different needs to happen because the way things have been going for the past several years don't seem to be working anymore, right? Right? The same old politicians arguing about the same old things, passing the same old policies that only perpetuate the same old problems, right? Many in America are thinking it's time for something new, something different, something better. Now, we start today's message this way, talking about all these things, to make a connection to right now to what many people were feeling during Jesus' time. The Jewish people that Jesus ministered to, um, they had been living under foreign occupation and rule for hundreds of years. And while they were able to, to live in their promised land, they were able to practice their faith, they weren't truly free. All of their lives, they were lived under the watchful eye of the Roman Empire. Even most of the Jewish leaders, they were people appointed by Rome who they knew would govern according to Roman law. And at any moment, Rome, they could flex their mighty military muscles and wipe the Jewish nation out if they didn't follow by the rules, which eventually did happen in 70 AD. And so you can imagine the people, especially the common people, seeing the social climate and desiring something different, something better, something new. I think many of us feel that way right now. You can also imagine on the other side of that, the excitement that started to spread throughout the region as a man named Jesus started to talk about the kingdom of God in a new way. And not only did he teach something different and better, but he backed up his teaching by performing miracles, signs, and wonders, right? Could it be that this new thing that everyone was longing for was finally here? And what we hear Jesus say multiple times throughout the Gospels is, yes, the kingdom of God is here. I'm doing a new thing. And what we're going to see in Luke today as we continue in our Jesus for Everyone series um, is Jesus taking the kind of steps you'd expect someone to take when trying to form a new nation, a new nation. 
Not a nation made up of land with borders and landmarks, but a nation made up of people with new leaders, uh, living under a new law, and living under a new king. And so the title of today's message is A New Nation. Would you join me in prayer again uh, before we jump into the Scriptures this morning? And as we pray, would you just ask God to speak to you, to prepare your heart to receive whatever it is He has for you today? Would you know that you can talk to God right now? You can speak to Him. And He's listening. And so we thank you, God, that your ears are open to us. We've come into your presence. We've been worshiping you, seeking you, God. Our desire is to behold you and be transformed into the likeness of your Son. And so would you help us to do that today as we read your word, as we read your scripture, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. May it come alive for us today so that we can see you, God. We love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke, if you haven't gotten there already. And open up to chapter 6. We're going to read verses 12 through 26 today. Not as long of a passage as we have been over the past few weeks, but still a pretty dense one. And as we're reading, what I want you to do is I want you to start identifying, trying to identify what this new nation is like. Okay, who belongs to this new nation? Who are its leaders? What laws govern this nation? Because these are all things that that good and lasting nations have, all right? And so let's read together Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 26. It says this, In these days... This is Jesus. He went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus. And Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Verse 17. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases." And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from Jesus and healed them all. Verse 20, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich. This is not a good thing. Woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. All right, so in this passage, uh, Jesus. He's taking steps to form a new nation, Um, and I'm going to show you the evidence of that in just a moment, Uh, but probably the the greatest moment that makes forming this new nation even possible is verse 12. It's the most important part of this entire passage, verse 12. It says that Jesus goes to a mountain and He prays, not just for a few minutes, or even for a few hours, it says he prays all night. And the pattern that we see in Jesus' life is that all of his big moments are preceded 
by prayer. Let me say that again. All of his big moments in life are preceded by prayer. Okay, before he launches out into ministry, we read this before, for the very first time, he goes out to the wilderness and what does he do? He prays. He prays. For how long? 40 days and nights. Here in this verse, before he takes steps to form his new nation, he prays for an entire night. Uh, Before his transfiguration, we haven't gotten there yet, but he prays. Before going to the cross, he prays. All of Jesus' big life moments are preceded by prayer. And not just short stints of prayer while on the way to work or before meals or before going to bed, but long periods of prayer by himself, alone with his Father in heaven. Some people even refer to the Gospel of Luke as the Gospel of Prayer because Jesus is depicted as praying more times in Luke than any other Gospel. Right? There's no doubt that Jesus' life is a lifestyle of prayer. Right? We see that. Okay? And not just Jesus, but also his followers in the years after his resurrection and his ascension. Okay, but, but have you noticed that while Jesus was here on earth, we don't see very much mention of the disciples praying? Did you notice that? Or they're depicted as being really bad at prayer. Who else feels that way, right? They have to go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Or when Jesus invites them to pray, what do they do? They fall asleep, right? They fall asleep. Okay, but as soon as Jesus ascends into heaven, what do they start doing? They start praying. They start praying. And many big moments in the life of the early church that we read about in the book of Acts, they are also preceded by prayer. Now, uh, some things that we read in the Bible are descriptive, and some of them are prescriptive. Descriptive meaning that the authors just kind of describe what was happening in the moment, but we aren't necessarily meant to do the exact same things that we're reading in that moment. Uh, And prescriptive meaning that the Bible is telling us things that we should be doing in our own lives. And so let me ask you this. Is Jesus' lifestyle of prayer and the early church's lifestyle of prayer purely descriptive or is it prescriptive? I think we all agree that it's prescriptive, right? Follow-up question. When's the last time you stayed up all night praying to God? When's the last time you woke up really early in the morning before the sun came up and you got alone to be with God in prayer? When's the last time you were so exhausted uh, from a, a full day or even a full week and you said, you know, I know what I need right now to be rejuvenated. I need to pray. I need to pray. When's the last time you gathered with other believers and prayed long and hard over a very specific situation? Okay, listen, even if we have engaged in these kinds of prayer, have we done so with the same kind of frequency that Jesus and the early church did? I wonder if our lack of prayer is the reason that so many people feel stuck. I wonder if our lack of prayer is... The reason we don't see the Holy Spirit moving today the way he did in the early church, right? Pentecostals and Charismatics, who our denomination we would identify with, we're always begging, Holy Spirit, move. Come, Holy Spirit, work in our lives. But I think at the same time, God is begging his people to pray, to pray, to pray. And that if we'll follow in our master's footsteps, Jesus and commit to his lifestyle of prayer, then we'll see the Holy Spirit move. We won't feel stuck. Or when we do feel stuck, prayer will lead us to respond in a healthy way rather than buying the red Ferrari or getting the tattoo we'll regret later on in life. Right? All of Jesus' biggest moments and all of the church's biggest moments were preceded by prayer. Everything that we read today in Luke so far, right, choosing the apostles, that's a really big deal. The healings and the deliverances, the teachings, listen, it all flowed from prayer, from prayer. It was all done under the influence of prayer. 
And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what am I living under the influence of? What am I living under the influence of? Prayer or something else? Like self-reliance, anxiety, fear, doubt, stress, control, pride. What are we living under the influence of? You know what? I think living a life under the influence of prayer versus something else uh, is like the difference between driving sober and driving drunk. Okay, when you're sober-minded, you make really good decisions for the most part, right? And you make it safely to your destination. Okay, when you're under the influence of, of alcohol or drugs or texting or lack of sleep, you make terrible decisions, causing yourself harm, but also possibly others. And living a life under the influence of prayer is like driving sober. Do you hear what I'm saying, church family? Right? But if you've ever lived under the influence of fear or anxiety or pride or self-reliance, just to name a few, you know it causes you to make terrible decisions and people get hurt along the way, including yourself. So, are we following Jesus and living our lives under the influence of prayer, of prayer? Are we committing to a lifestyle of prayer like Jesus, our master, and the early church did? If so, I think we'll see a huge difference in our lives. Amazing things will flow from that place of prayer. And if we behold Jesus through the book of Luke and see the many moments when he prays and how he prays, then we'll become like him. We'll we'll catch on to prayer and implement it into our own lives. That's all I'm going to say on prayer. I'm not going to get into too many details. Um, We will see more of of prayer in Jesus' life throughout this book, and so we'll get back to it. But the point is, what are you living under the influence of? And right after Jesus spends an entire night praying, he begins taking steps to form this new nation, right? But the the important thing is that he establishes this nation first in prayer, first in prayer. And then he gathers all of his disciples, and then he picks 12 of them to be his apostles. Now, up until this moment, Jesus has been actively recruiting disciples. We've read that already, right? We see Jesus say to Peter, James, and John, come, follow me. We see Jesus recruit Levi, a.k.a. Matthew, and he says to him, come, follow me, be my disciples. And he's been recruiting many more unnamed people to be his disciples too. But right here, this is the first time we see Jesus recruit his apostles, his apostles. Now, what's the difference between a disciple of Jesus and an apostle of Jesus? Have you ever wondered that? Well, a disciple is anyone who commits to learning from Jesus and living according to his ways. Another word for for disciple is apprentice. A disciple is like an apprentice, someone who learns from a skilled master in order uh, to, to do what they do. There are many disciples of Jesus right here in this room today, right? Many of you have said, not only do I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I also want to follow in his footsteps. And that's the difference between a convert and a disciple. A disciple wants to do what Jesus did, right? I want to learn from him, and I want to live like him. Are you a disciple? But an apostle is different. An apostle of Jesus is a disciple of Jesus, but with a special mission. Okay, the Greek word for apostle, when used in, in non-religious context, it would cause people to think of a naval expedition where, where a ruler would send out people uh, in ships to go explore the seas and find new lands that they could bring under their rule. Think of Magellan. Think of Marco Polo. Not the app, but the actual guy, right? Marco Polo or, or Christopher Columbus. They were all essentially apostles of their rulers, And when Jesus chooses 12 apostles from his his disciples, he has something very similar in mind. Jesus is forming this new nation, and he's ultimately going to expand this new nation, and he knows he can't do it all by himself. And so he chooses 12 apostles. 
Okay, the, the 12 apostles, several of them, fishermen, familiar with boats and the open seas. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. Right? But they were to be King Jesus' emissaries sent out into the world to spread and establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And the reason he picks 12 is because Jesus knew his mission had to start with the nation of Israel first, God's chosen people. And the nation of Israel is made up of how many tribes? 12 tribes. And so God, he originally chose the nation of Israel uh, for the same reason that Jesus chooses the 12 apostles. The 12 tribes of Israel were supposed to be God's apostles, God's holy envoy to the rest of the world, representing who God is and, and what his kingdom is all about. But sadly, the nation of Israel failed that mission. They failed. Instead of representing God to the other nations, they became like the other nations and they rejected God instead. And even when they repented and when they started following God again, they became insular and exclusive, wanting nothing to do with the nations that they were expected to reach. And so Jesus, wanting to establish a new nation that would succeed in fulfilling God's purposes, chooses 12 new apostles. Do you see the, the connection, the relationship? And in chapter 9, um, we're going to see Jesus send out his apostles to proclaim the kingdom of God to the nation of Israel first. Okay, they're they're going to act as, as the first leaders in this new nation who will recruit new citizens, or we call them disciples, to be a part of this new nation. And what's interesting about the, the 12 apostles is that they are nothing like the kind of people who we would expect a king to select as his royal dignitaries. The, these guys are a ragtag group of ordinary, uh, some would even say less than ordinary men. Um, many of them are fishermen, which wasn't actually a, uh, you know, a respectable profession during that time. One of them is considered a, a traitor to his nation because he's a tax collector. Another is this hardcore uh, nationalist, a Jewish nationalist, a religious zealot. One of them, Jesus knows, is going to betray him. Some of them are brothers. A few of these men are even related to Jesus. And they're all young. They're inexperienced men, possibly as young as 18 years old. Okay, when you think of royal dignitaries, ambassadors to foreign lands, leaders who will help you form a new nation, these are not the kind of people that we'd expect to see, right? But when you're trying, listen, when you're trying to do something new, to get out of a rut, you can't do the same things. You always do expecting different results. And what we learn from history is that these 12 apostles, they succeeded in their mission and they start the greatest kingdom expansion movement the world has ever known. Okay, if God can change the world with a ragtag group of 12 ordinary men, what could God do with you? Right? And that's become a cliche thing to say, but do we actually think about it and believe it? Right? I, I look out at, at who is in our midst, in our church family right now, and I know the stories of many of you where God is using some of you to build His kingdom. And I know that Jesus is still in the business of using the unexpected to achieve the extraordinary. Listen, right here in our midst, we've got former addicts. We have former drunks, former fornicators, former homosexuals, adulterers, swindlers, idolaters, all in our midst, in this room. But you have been washed, sanctified, and justified in Christ Jesus and you are now being used by God for His glorious kingdom-building purposes. Amen. He's still choosing us and sending us out to build His kingdom. Amen. And I, for one, and am incredibly thankful for that. Okay, Jesus is still sending out His apostles. Right? But before He sends out His 12 apostles in Luke, uh, He has to train them first. Because right? these are just ordinary dudes. Not even the brightest you know, bulbs in the crayon box. Oh, I mixed it up, right? It's the brightest colors in the crayon box. Um, so he has to train them up first. 
He has to teach them. He has to make sure that they know what his kingdom is all about and what it looks like to live in his kingdom. And so in verses 17 through 19, Jesus and his disciples, including his newly appointed apostles, um, they come down the mountain and they are met by this large crowd of people from all over the region. And Jesus takes this moment as an opportunity to train and equip by modeling what his kingdom is all about. And he first teaches his disciples that his kingdom is for everyone. His kingdom is for everyone. You see a multitude of people from all over the region, including the non-Jewish pagan towns of Tyre and Sidon. They're all coming to, to encounter Jesus. And Jesus doesn't turn any of them away. No barriers are set up to prevent them from coming to Jesus. Instead, he heals all of them of their diseases. He delivers all of them from their unclean spirits because Jesus is for everyone. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we believe that? Now, I know that we believe that in theory. As a slogan for a sermon series, yay, Jesus is for everyone, right? We like it. It's good. But do we believe that in practice? As a church, do we welcome all people into our gathering to have an encounter with Jesus? Do we have any barriers in our midst that would prevent someone from experiencing Jesus? Okay, here's the test of that. Well, I'll give you two tests. The first, the epistles talk about something called partiality, where the church, they were showing preferential treatment to certain groups of people and neglecting. They would let them into the church, no doubt. But they're showing partiality towards some groups over the other. Are we partial? Are we partial? Okay, here's the second test. If someone came into our church seeking prayer for healing or deliverance, and you knew that they were of a different religion or of a different political party, or or, or they lived a radically different lifestyle than you, would you be willing to be the one to lay your hands on them and pray for them? If they were a known enemy to you, would you be willing to be the one to pray for them? Now, sure, we can speculate. Would someone like that come into our church speaking, seeking prayer? I don't know. But, but Luke's, Luke is very clear in his description that there are two very different groups of people in this scene. There are Jesus, his disciples and apostles. That's one group. And then there's everybody else. And this distinction would lead us to believe that there were believers and unbelievers alike seeking to have an encounter with Jesus. The religious and the non-religious, pagans and and Jewish Puritans, and Jesus welcomed them all, healed them all, it says, and delivered them all, because that's what His kingdom is all about. And if we want to be in His kingdom, we must be about that too. And I think that's why Jesus did so much of his ministry, not inside the synagogues, but outside, because the synagogues had had boundaries and barriers that prevented some people from coming in. And so he goes out and says, we're not going to have that in my kingdom. So Jesus teaches through action what his kingdom is all about. His kingdom is for everyone. And then moving on in verses 20 through 49, Jesus goes into one of his most famous teachings And he starts laying out the law of the land, the law of the land, the law of this new nation that he's forming, because you you can't have a nation without laws for everyone to follow. You could try. I don't think history has proven that to be very fruitful, right? And so this teaching is known as the the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. Maybe you're familiar with that term, Uh, but we have a shorter version of it here in Luke's Gospel. It's very possible that Jesus preached this sermon more than once. If you've ever met any traveling evangelists, they often preach the same messages all over the place. It's possible that Jesus preached this sermon more than once and in different places, and that would explain why Matthew's version is so much longer than Luke's. But when you compare the two, the message is essentially the same, which is what's most important, right? Okay, today, um, we're only going to look 
uh, at the start of the sermon in verses 20 through 26. And then next week, we'll finish out the sermon. So you got to come back to get the rest of it, all right? Um, and what we see, you're ready to look through 20 and 26? We need to stretch. Everybody okay? You're awfully quiet this morning, but that's all right. You're thinking. That's what I'm going to tell myself. Um, and what we see in verses uh, 20 through 26 uh, is a series of blessings and curses. Blessings and curses. Okay, the blessings are known as the Beatitudes, which is taken from the Latin words for blessed are. Blessed are, that's the Beatitudes. And, and the curses all start with woe to you, which we don't really use that word today, but it's not a good word, or we use it in good ways, right? This is a bad way. Woe to you. And Jesus is teaching what it means to be blessed in this new nation he's forming and what it means to be cursed, what it looks like to have favor in this new nation and what it looks like to not have favor. And what we see right away is that Jesus challenges the typical notions of what it means to be blessed and what it means to be cursed. Because when we think of blessing, we think of abundance, right? We think of an abundance of finances and food. We think of happiness and health. We think of having favor with the people around us. In fact, those are the things that we actively pursue every day of our lives, isn't it? Can we even call and label people like this as, you know, like hashtag blessed, right? They add it to their Instagram post. Something good happens, hashtag blessed, right? On the other hand, those who are poor and hungry, sad and sick, and and those who are rejected by society, they are not seen as blessed, are they? We'd say something must be wrong with them. They've been dealt a, a bad hand in life. All of us actively try to avoid these things every day of our lives, right? That's not hashtag blessed. It's not Instagram worthy, right? But Jesus is doing something new, right? And this new nation he's forming requires new ways of thinking. If you want to be blessed in the kingdom of God, you have to think differently about what it means to be blessed and how you pursue blessing. And the biggest change in our thinking that we have to make, here it is, is that real blessing is dependent not on our present circumstances, but on our future. Real blessing isn't dependent on our present circumstances, but on our future. Real blessing isn't what is achieved right here, right now in this life, but in the life to come. And Jesus, he gives us two case studies to look at as examples to know what it looks like to be blessed in this new nation and what it looks like to be cursed. And so in verse 20, it says that Jesus turned to his disciples specifically. He's talking to them. And he says, blessed are you, my disciples, who are poor, hungry, weeping, and hated. And and the tense here is really important. Jesus is saying to his disciples, his followers, you are poor, hungry, weeping, and hated right now, this moment. And even more so, he's saying you are these things right now because of me. On account of the Son of Man, he says, because you are my followers, this is the way you are. And what we know of many of the disciples is that they left behind their livelihoods as fishermen and tax collectors in order to follow Jesus. They left behind their families and friends, all of these things that we typically think we need in order to be hashtag blessed in this world. They they left it behind. And instead, they encountered struggle as followers of Jesus. People started to hate Jesus And if you followed him, then Jesus' enemies became your enemies. Jesus is essentially promising them, if you want to be a part of my new nation, if you want to be my disciples, this is going to be your fate in this world. And the world might not see you as blessed, but real blessing isn't what is achieved here and now in this life, 
but in the life to come. At the same time, though, Jesus is promising his disciples that they will have even greater blessing in the eternal kingdom of God than they could ever have right here on this earth. Right? You're poor, you're hungry, you're weeping and hated because of me right now, but the kingdom will be yours, he says. He promises. You will be satisfied. You will laugh. You will receive rewards in heaven because of me later and forever. And so Jesus, he first addresses his disciples, those who are truly blessed. And then he turns to everyone else in verses 24 through 26. And he says, woe to you who are rich, full, laughing, and accepted by others right now. Woe to you. Is that what we would say to people who are in that circumstance right now? Woe to you. He's saying you live your life pursuing immediate and temporary satisfaction from this world, often at the expense of others. And if your desire is more for this world than it is the kingdom of God, then all you're going to get is the world. That's it. And there's nothing waiting for you in heaven. Wow, Jesus. But why? Because real blessing isn't achieved right here, right now in this life, but it's in the life to come. And Jesus is presenting the crowd assembled before him with a choice. He's saying, do you want to be a part of my eternal kingdom of heaven or this temporary kingdom of the world? Do you want eternal blessing or temporary blessing? The world has its way of thinking and understanding of blessing, but it's in complete contradiction to the kingdom of heaven. It's incompatible. Right? If you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you can't think like the world does because real blessing isn't dependent on the here and now, but on the future. Which one do you want, Jesus is saying? The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Now listen, real quick. If you are rich, if you're full If you're happy and rejoicing right now, Jesus isn't saying that those are necessarily bad things if those are a result of you seeking the kingdom of God first. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you see the difference? If your blessing, and and the Word does say that when we follow Jesus, there, there could be opportunity for financial blessing, for provision, for joy. Those are opportunities if we are seeking the kingdom of God first. But if we're pursuing the world first for what the world has to offer, if that's our greatest priority, Jesus says that's all you're getting. That's all you're getting. And here's why one of those choices is obviously better than the other. Because we know that this world is unstable and dying, right? Turn on the news if you need to be reminded of that. Nations rise and nations fall. Resources are plentiful in one moment and then dried up in the next. And the person who puts their blessing in the world, they have to fight to protect and preserve their blessing because they know it could all go away in a single moment. Right? But the person who puts their blessing in the kingdom of heaven knows that no matter how bad things get right here on earth, something eternally better is waiting for them. And so Jesus would say to his followers, he would say to us today, now this is going to be hard to hear, but I hope you understand. Jesus would say, follow me until it hurts. Follow me until it hurts, but oh, how blessed you will be. Follow me even if it means being poor, hungry, sad, and hated, but oh, how blessed you will be. Not only will you be blessed in the future, he says, but but if you you read again, he says, you can rejoice, you can leap for joy right now because your future hope is what will sustain you through all of the difficulties that life will throw at you, Right. right? You can get through almost anything knowing that it will pay off for you in the future, right? All of you mamas who labored and birthed your children, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You have a better advantage than us men do about what it means to 
stick through it, right? To, to go through it. But it's the same when we put our hope in Jesus and seek first his kingdom. And so to wrap up, Jesus is forming a new nation. Do you see it? And he's establishing that nation first and foremost in prayer. Church family, we got to pray. I know you hear it all the time. We got to pray. I would even challenge you one day this week, if you can, stay up all night praying. It's okay if you don't know how to, how to pray or you don't feel like you're good at praying. Spend a whole night just speaking to God. Talk to Him. What could happen? We don't know because we've never done it, right? Let's pray, church family. And He's establishing this new nation in prayer. Everything in this nation flows from prayer. And so if we want to be a part of this nation, it's got to flow from prayer in our own lives too. Right? Then he's gathering citizens or disciples to be a part of this nation. He's sending out leaders, delegates, apostles to recruit more citizens and gain more ground for his nation. Jesus is teaching what his na- new nation is all about. It's a kingdom for everyone. Right? Everyone can experience and have an encounter with King Jesus as long as we're not the ones who are putting up the barriers right, to prevent them from coming. And real blessing isn't what's achieved here and now in this life, but in the life to come. If we want to be a part of King Jesus' kingdom, we have to change our thinking of what it means to be blessed and what blessing looks like. If we want to be a part of Jesus' kingdom, it's going to take following him until it hurts, but oh, how blessed we will be. Oh, how blessed we'll be. And so church family, what are you beholding And what are you becoming? Annette, you can come on up. What are you beholding? And what are you becoming? Are you beholding King Jesus and His kingdom? And is that shaping your understanding of what it means to be blessed? Right, let's put our hope in Him, church family, in His kingdom, not in this world, not in the people of this world, but in Him. And let's let that hope sustain us through this life.